The monks used to be at Garion Mill and Garion Tower in the 15th century. Garion Tower was the summer residence of the Bishop of Glasgow from 1484 to 1703. An old book tells of the vaulted rooms at Garion Tower. These rooms now house the central heating boiler and the wine cellar, but in those days they were probably bedrooms. After the Bishop of Glasgow, the next owner that I know of is Mr Scott of the distillery in Wishaw. He lived in Garion Tower for years and always went to work in a carriage with his coachman who always wore a fur cape. When we were kids at school, we used to see them pass by and thought he was such a grand man. Mr Scott's son was in the Boer War and when the war was over and he came home, the pipe band from Overton came down and serenaded him and Mr Scott went out with whiskey and dished it out right, left and centre. Many years later, when we were visiting a place near Edinburgh, we asked an old man for directions and he replied, I don't know anything about here. I come from a wee place you won't know the name of, but it's Overton. We said that we lived at the bottom of the hill and he knew all about it. I don't know who came after Mr Scott, but later there was a Captain Colville and the Colvilles were in Gary and Tower for a number of years. He gave up the tower and went to Penhale in Cornwall. He sold Gary and Tower to Mr Bihar for the price of new carpets in his house in Cornwall. Now Mr Bihar owned Gary and Tower for a number of years but never actually lived in it. He sold it to Mr Simmons, the fruit broker in Glasgow, who lived there for 12 or 14 years. Now Mrs Simmons later became a widow and she sold the property to Mr Warnock, my husband. We then let it to a Mr Young on a 10 year term, but he died before his time was up and his widow lived in it for 30 years. When the Scots and the Colvilles lived at Gary and Tower, they always kept a butler, a housemaid, a cook, other servants and three gardeners, as there was a tennis court and a putting green to look after, as well as the larger grounds. When Mr Warnock bought it, he turned the putting green into more use. The war was on at that time and he grew vegetables on it. The Big Copper Beach was famous around here. It was huge like a like a temple underneath. Mr Warnock put a lot of straw under it during the war so that if we were bombed out of the farm, there would always be straw to feed cattle. One Saturday afternoon, however, a great storm blew it down. It was a very old tree. Owls had taken possession of the straw. You could always hear them. There must have been four or five nests. When I was young, I remembered the water pit down at the bottom as you come up straight across from the Garion Tower, over on the left-hand side at the junction where the road goes to Curluck by the entrance to Cambusnet and House. As a young lassie, I used to take my plants down to the engine room as it was nice and warm in the winter time. Also, there was a pit up the hill towards Overton. When I was young, I went down the pit and saw the ponies. They brought the ponies up when the miners were on holiday and put them in the field by our cows. The miners all lived in nice houses in Overton with lovely gardens. They were very industrious. They had a grosset fair in Overton. In the farms and orchards, several Lithuanians worked. I remember one of our women telling a Lithuanian woman how to make a dumpling. She made it in a kettle and it was so swollen, she couldn't get it cut. On our farm, we grew strawberries and vegetables for consumption in Glasgow in the local shops. It was extra good, so they were all clamouring for it. The strawberries, currants and gooseberries went to the jam works at Law and to Scott at Curluck. On a Monday morning, I've seen three long loads go out one after another to the Glasgow markets at five o'clock in the morning. There was no fruit or vegetable market at Wisha, but there was a cattle market. Before growing fruit, we had a herd of tuberculin tested cattle. We were one of the first tuberculin tested. But mostly, we carried out both sides of the business. From December onwards, we took on people to grow tomato plants. This was an industry, and we supplied a tremendous number of growers with tomato plants to plant for themselves when they were starting their spring crop. They always bought their tomato plants from us. 
We deliver tomato plants to Edinburgh, Falkirk, Ayr and all over the place. A lot of these growers are out of business now though. But when I was very young, only three years of age, my mother took us down through the orchard to the main road where we saw General Lockhart's funeral going past. There were no soldiers there, perhaps they would have been at the graveyard. I was too young to understand anything like that, but there was a long procession of carriages after the hearse. The Lockharts lived in Cambus Nathan House at this time. They were the real gentry. They kept a butler, a footman and other servants. They were the only ones I remember being the real gentry, except Lord and Lady Newlands at Mosley Castle. They had full staff too. Their castles had no central heating. It was all coal fires then. They kept a man whose full-time job was to look after the fires cleaned all the grates and carried up the coal. The Campbells were very good at visiting their tenants. They would call round and have a chat to see how they were keeping. After the Campbells, I don't know who had Campbell's Nathing House, but I do remember Mr John Craig living there. He was a very fine gentleman. He changed the name to Campbell's Nathan Priory. Before then, it had always been known as Campbell's Nathan House. Mr Craig had plenty of servants and looked after the house very well. After Mr Craig came a local farmer, Mr Barr, who later sold it to Mr Wilson, who has now put it up for sale again. I think Mr Wilson has been in the house for about 11 years. Mr Barr took away a lot of the lovely trees that surrounded Cambus Nathan House. There was also a gardener's cottage near the house, but that's now been knocked down. My father used to tell us when we were young that there was any amount of salmon in the banks of the Clyde and you could always catch them coming up the river. Some of the farming folks were having salmon for every meal. It was such a cheap food then and there was plenty of it. That was when the river was clean, before all the work started and they put their muck into it. It's just been lovely to reminisce about all the lovely memories of Gary and Tiver.